Okay, so in this portion of the lecture, we're going to cover chapter eight of Even the Rat Was White. So this chapter really covered the first black man to receive his PhD in psychology and his name was Francis Cecil Sumner. So just a little bit of background information about um, Dr. Sumner was that he was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and he had this very strong and passionate interest into learning, into reading. Um, now, he was able to go through a middle school, elementary school. However, he didn't have formal high school education, but that didn't stop him from wanting to achieve in his own, um, his own academics. He got books on his own, he read on his own. His parents helped uh, facilitate his love of learning. So just to give you uh, like a time frame for uh, Dr. Sumner, he received his doctorate in 1920. Uh, and that was about 34 years after the first American to receive their doctorate in psychology. And that person was Joseph Jastrow. Um, and he got his uh, PhD from John Hopkins. Uh, Dr. Sumner got his from Clark University. Um, and just to be very frank, Dr. Sumner, while it's not really highlighted too much in the history of psychology, he was very influential in his work, um, and he did a lot of social justice advocacy um, within the field of psychology. And he was, to some folks, uh, controversial, but we're gonna talk a little bit about that after, but let's talk about his education. So starting off, we're gonna talk about Lincoln University, and he was actually permitted to enroll as a uh, first year at Lincoln University when he was about 15 years old. Um, so this is a very big feat, and by 1915, he actually graduated from Lincoln University as magna, with magna cum laude with special honors in English, modern languages, Greek, Latin, and philosophy. So just to throw this out there, um, he wasn't interested into psychology from the get-go. He actually wanted to be a writer. Uh, and during that time at Lincoln, uh, he worked really hard to pay for his uh, to contribute to college expenses. His parents also pitched in to pay for the fees and tuition. Um, but taken together, he, he did graduate. Um, and during that time at Lincoln University, he made correspondences with James P. Porter. Um, James P. Porter was a professor um, and dean of college at Clark University, which is where um, Sumner would go later on. And now with this connection, um, with this connection, this facilitated um, a little bit of his interest towards psychology, but we don't really see that until a little bit later. Now at Clark College, um, he still continued on with pursuing uh, his literary interests by getting into English courses and he was taking electives in foreign languages. And at the same time, he was taking electives in psychology too. So some have made note that he, while he had this passion for writing, that passion was stronger for, for psychology. And most of the time people can find him like reading, uh, reading books, uh, books that are considered psychological in nature. He graduated from Clark College uh, with his BA in English in 1916, uh, and this is June. So this is his second bachelor's degree to be clear. Now, during that time, he was building a relationship with um, G. Stanley Hall. And if you remember on what we talked about um, with G. Stanley Hall, very, very, uh, at that point in, to our, in our eyes, and our modern eyes, very, very controversial. He did provide his support for eugenics um, and he supported the belief in sterilization of folks who were poor and those who were not deemed part of the superior race. But of note, at that point in time, uh, G. Stanley Hall was actually considered fairly liberal. Um, and so when we're looking back, 
uh, we don't consider him as liberal, but in his contemporary time, he was, and he made a friendship with Sumner. Um, G. Stanley Hall actually provided a lot of support and encouragement to him, as well as other Black students. Um, now, this wasn't like out in the open. This was behind closed doors. It was typically not in public. Um, and during, uh, during Sumner's service in the war, specifically World War I, G. Stanley Hall continued his correspondence with him. And throughout Sumner's uh, professional, I, I say academic and professional career, um, he, and, uh, he and Hall remained fairly good friends and colleagues. Now, uh, Hall did encourage, uh, he did encourage Sumner to pursue psychology, but at that point in time, um, Sumner wasn't there yet. Um, it really wasn't until he got to Lincoln University where he, he, was, uh, he went back to Lincoln University and he felt that he was torn between psychology and German. Um, so during that time, he studied religious psychology, philosophy, and German. And teaching basically made up the bulk of the program. So he taught on religion, mysticism, and rationalism, um, experimental psychology, social psych, as well as uh, intermediate and advanced German. So you can see throughout his time back at Lincoln University, um, he was diving more and more into psychology and psychology-like um, psychology -like fields. It wasn't a little bit till later that he started looking into graduate schools um, that he sought, he sought some advice from, um, from Dr. Porter. And at that point in time, he was, he felt, torn between going to psychology and um and german the reason being is for finances right remember at that point in time if you were pursuing a doctorate or you had a doctor in psychology and be working as a psychologist there wasn't a lot of financial gain in it compared to if you're you know teaching german um in sumner's case uh Graduate programs in German, German um, they provided the best chances for financial assistance. But Sumner felt very strongly towards psychology. He actually was more so leaning towards it. And he was making these references that it wasn't about the money. Um, and he seems like, uh, he felt as though there was like a great demand for it, especially for folks of color. Now, uh, Dr. Porter's response basically like reinforced it without, um, he reinforced it without reinforcing it. So he suggested to Sumner, you know, go into the field that you want, but if you go into psychology, it's gonna be a great service um, and great service to uh, other black folks. So, at that point in time, Sumner, Sumner did get some um, responses from American University and University of Illinois. He actually was rejected. And he wrote out to G. Stanley Hall to consider him for a junior fellowship in psychology to study race psychology. Now, I remember during the 1917s, race psychology was a very big thing. You saw a lot of um, works looking at uh, studying black and brown folks, right? Um, and for the most part, conceptualizing deficits in black and brown folks. Sumner, I will be clear, was very aware of this um, injustice within the field of psychology, and he did make notes of it. Um, but we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So Sumner, during his time, um, as teaching and as a graduate student, he, did, he wasn't paid. Um, he actually impressed uh, G. Stanley Hall about being paid. 
um, and his inability to find a position. So basically he was reaching out to G. Stanley Hall for help. Um, and before you know it, after he received his MA from Lincoln, uh, he actually got accepted at Clark University. So during his time at Clark, um, he recognized uh, he recognized a lot of like the social injustice towards black folks in the US. Um, and as he was um, as he was going through his um, through, through his time, he was very he felt conflicted about that. Um, he recognized the inconsistencies of like the popular accusations of like um, World War I against the Germans um, as being these symbols of, um, of barbarians and uh, irreligiousness. And he would note the same things that they talk about the Germans being in the US media, um, the same thing was being happened to, uh, happening towards black and brown folks as well as like uh, Chinese folks within the US. So he was very much aware of that and he even felt, a, he felt really strongly about it. Um, so at one point he actually wrote a letter that criticized um, the US. And the thing about this um, letter, it actually got him into uh, some hot water. He sent this letter to uh, the local newspaper, uh, he sent it to the local newspaper and they were very concerned that he might have, you know, if they tested his loyalty, um, you know, asking, you know, should we, are you a spy? Are you, are you German um, sympathizer? Uh, so forth and so on. And in 1918, um, after he wrote those letters, he apologized in a letter to the newspaper for the circumstances of his disloyalty to his native country. Um, so he apologized for what he said. Uh, now, G. Stanley Hall, while most folks didn't know about it at that time, he actually cleared the air and provided, so he, he backed up Sumner's, um, Sumner's experience, okay? Um, and if you look on page 221, uh, that long paragraph could basically sum that up, but taken together, G. Stanley Hall was in support of Sumner despite, um, oddly enough, despite like his public values and his views. So after, um, after this shenanigan, uh, Sumner actually he finished his study and it basically looked at the psychoanalysis of Freud and Adler. Um, this is a very big thing. Now, while he wrote, um, he wrote to, uh, to Hall to consider that work as a, dis as a dissertation, he got drafted into the army. Um, and his service for, from 1918 to 19, uh, 1918 to 1919, um, he was really upset about that interruption into his graduate studies. Um, he did his best to find humor, um, humor in the time. Uh, and he continued correspondence with G. Stanley Hall. So at this point, G. Stanley Hall was like a mentor to, uh, to Sumner. And he talked a lot about his experiences within the military and what he reflected, he said it was like the greatest fear he ever experienced. Um, so he, it wasn't a good experience for him. It wasn't until like 1919 in the middle of it that uh, he stayed in France. But during that time, he, he went to Southern France, like Chambry, Lyons and Dijon, I think I said that wrong. Um, and to Paris. So he made his time where he could. Um, but uh, from reading this chapter, he did not have the best experience. Um, 
Now he did return. Um, he actually was approved as a senior fellow for his academic year in 1919 to 1920. Um, and during his time at Clark University, his dissertation, um, well, he passed. <laughs> so, uh, so his dissertation, um, so his dissertation was psychoanalysis of Freud and Adler, and it was approved and it was accepted on the same day, which is really good. So on June 14th, 1920, he became the first Black American to receive his PhD in psychology. And his dissertation published in Pedagogical Seminary, um, which is later renamed the Journal of Genetic Psychology. And really, it was a really good dissertation um, at that point in time. So let's move on to talking about his, um, his, like his work and his jobs. So he's had several teaching positions. Um, so he first started teaching at Wilbur University in Ohio. Then for a summer, he taught at Southern University of Louisiana. That is an HBCU, by the way. Um, now, it wasn't until about 1921 where he took, a where he took to be a professor um, at West Virginia College Institute, which is also known now by West Virginia State College. Um, and he basically had uh, Dr. Porter's well, not he, but Dr. Porter actually spoke um, on his behalf um, as a reference for him. So Sumner was making pretty good ground at this point in time in his first, his first couple of years. So when he became an instructor, um, he, he loved it. Um, he was very, he was very, uh, he was happy to be on in that environment. Um, he thought the campus was beautiful. He liked his salary, right? Um, and one of his main contributions during that time was um, the core and context in the drowsy state. And that was contributed to the American Journal of Psychology. Now, during his time at, um, at this specific institution, he actually went on to attack like classical heredity um, and environmental arguments. So I remember during this time, 1920 to 19, uh, to the 19, like even further than that, um, during, excuse me, so during the 1920s, you had that conversation, you had the promotion of eugenics um, and heredity of intelligence um, within mainstream psychology and Sumner wasn't having it. Um, Instead, he basically was like, this is poo, um, and it sucks uh, in, a, in a very, not in, the, in, the, in the shortest way I can say possible. Now, the thing about his work, a lot of his research was unfunded. Um, so that's at that point in time that's actually hard he was applying for fundings from white agencies and he'd get um refused uh he often was isolated from his white colleagues um so what he considered he considered this to be like um the obsession of race persecution and According to that, there were, um, he suggested some pathological symptoms. So he noted that amongst himself that he wasn't feeling too hot. He wasn't feeling too great. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Um, here he is, a faculty member of color, working to get um, his work out and having to work twice as hard, twice, twice as hard, only to get little than less respect. Um, and even at the same time, less funding. So taken together, he experienced a lot of isolation and he called the attention to what other black intellectuals um, were feeling, especially those who were forced to teach in rural environments. 
a lot of black institutions that were um, a lot of black colleges were out of the way, out of the different parts of the country. So it made it completely hard for black intellectuals to um, get over there. While we look at some of that, while we look at like the fees back then, right? The bills, how much it costed to do this and that. Uh, the thing about it is at that point in time, salaries weren't that great either. Um, so altogether, what, uh, what uh, Francis Sumner experienced, um, a lot of other black intellectuals were experiencing as well. And he called to the, intention, uh, to the attention of that during his time. Now, by 1928, um, actually by 1927, he left West um, Virginia Collegiate Institute to go to Howard, to teach at Howard. And from working at Howard, he, what he did, he had this, this need, this want to expand the psychology department um, further than what it was, and he did. And during that time as a Howard University professor, he extended his lines of research into religion, into um, a little bit of mysticism as well. Um, and then he got into uh, administrations, uh, administrations of justice research. Um, so taken together, when he got to Howard University, he thrived there. Um, he provided a lot of different works um, at during that time. So now let's go back a little bit on his thoughts of racial prejudice and racism. Um, so during his time at West Virginia State College or, Institute, uh, or the Institute, same thing, he did receive a lot of refusals for funding. Um, he experienced isolation from his white colleagues and he attributed this to experiences of racial persecution. Um, so to be quite clear, Francis Sumner did experience racial prejudice as a faculty of color, um, he had to work twice as hard. And what we have not, what we have documented is his own um, interesting uh, endorsement of fundamentalist reforms, specifically that of Booker T. Washington. If you know about Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington was a very prominent black scholar at this uh, during this time, a little bit later. Um, and Booker T. Washington. Uh, ar argued and advocated for this ground up approach, this, uh, this bootstrap approach. If we work hard enough, then blacks, uh, if black folks work hard enough and engage in the trade, get in the trades, um, then black folks are gonna be accepted into the Western world. Now, to some at that point in time, that was not the best approach. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, came in and said, this is not the way that we want to do it. We want to get education. Uh, however, Sumner endorsed a lot of the beliefs of Booker T. Washington, suggested that the belief and acceptance uh, from Black folks was through Western culture. So for Black folks in, uh, endorsing Western culture, following it, and as a result, they would be accepted. He also proposed some drastic reductions in the number of um, black colleges. He suggested that there does need to be a reform for uh, black schools. So taken together, um, Sumner had some extreme, not I don't wanna say extreme beliefs, but they were a bit more fundamentalist um, compared to other folks. And in his later works, um, he actually did some writings for the Institute Monthly, where he tackled the issues surrounding like the earmarks of high intelligence. Um, he assigned self-education and creativeness as um, quote unquote, two infallible signs of high intelligence. If you think about it, he was that way. Um, when he first started out, right, he did not receive a formal high school education. Uh, and he was able to teach himself and move through that um, move through that time and get to where he was as well.
Of note, he also was the official abstractor for Psychological Bulletin and Journal of Social Psychology. This was a very big deal at the time. Uh, he was able to translate more than 3,000 articles from German, French, and Spanish. So this is a very, very big deal. Also to note, he's very big onto his work, especially in his work with students. Um, he had a very deep interest in his own students. Um, so taken together, um, Francis Sumner was a very, if we, so within mainstream psychology, um, we don't typically hear about um, psychologists of color. Francis Sumner was a very big deal in his time. Uh, and really through him, it was the way that um, he paved the way for a lot of other psychologists, for other black psychologists and psychologists of color. Now, was his, um, was all of his beliefs on the same line as most black folks at that time? Not really. Now he did, he was very outspoken against racial prejudice and racism. It's important to note though, like he had his own beliefs that were, that were seen as uh, fundamentalist. And I think it's important to put that in the context of his time. Um, so taken together, Francis Sumner, very big deal, very, very big deal. I also put in, there was also some personal information about him that I thought was really cool. Um, he was married twice, uh, professional affiliations, very involved in psychological associations, as you can see. As far as fraternal affiliations, um, he was a member of Psych High, Pi Gamma Mu, and um, Kappa Alpha Psi. Kappa Alpha Psi is a historically um, black fraternity and he had lifelong membership. Um, Francis Sumner died um, of a heart attack while he was shoveling snow. Um, and in his funeral, there was a very big tribute paid to him. So taken together, looking at what we talked about, Francis Sumner um, was able to show that black folks were very capable of working in psychology, of doing the work. And at the same time, also advocating against social injustices. So that's it for this lecture, for this part of the lecture. See you later.